Hey everybody, it's Dinosaur George from DinosaurGeorge.com. Uh, Trevor from Bury St. Edmunds, England wrote and said, um, uh, ever since he was a kid, four years of age, he loved dinosaurs. I'm glad to hear that, Trevor. <laughs> I, I know exactly how you feel. Uh, he basically said he loves dinosaurs, but he doesn't have a degree in paleontology. But that's not going to stop him from viewing uh, or from voicing his thoughts about dinosaurs. Let me tell you something, Trevor. I'm glad you brought that up. Having a degree is a very important thing, depending on what it is you do. But this notion that if you don't have a degree in paleontology, you can't speak intelligently about the subject is completely absurd. Every now and then, I get emails from people in paleontology who uh, are amazed that I dare speak about the subject of dinosaurs because I don't have a degree in paleontology. And I, I always find that amusing. I'm like, you know, I completely respect if you got a degree. I think that's spectacular. But this notion that somehow you, you can speak more intelligently than someone else is crazy. So don't let anybody do that. Don't let anybody tell you you can't voice your concern. And you're right. Dinosaurs are not like a closed organization where you have to join a club to enjoy them. So you keep doing what you want to do and keep proposing ideas and concepts. That's what science is about. Um, he asked me this. He said um, he's really, uh, really confused and puzzled about um, uh, how dinosaurs reproduce. And I got to tell you something. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of people that share that same uh, puzzlement with you. It is difficult to understand. Now, one of the ways we can kind of propose how they reproduce is look around at modern animals today, uh, certainly looking at the bigger animals, the rhinos, the hippos, the elephants, the giraffes, um, but also paying attention to uh, some of the reptiles and the birds. Um, you would be amazed at the variety of different reproductive methods that animals today use, and we can sort of attribute those to dinosaurs. So it's a very, uh, it's certainly a very difficult question to answer with any certainty, but the best way we can determine those things is by looking at living, breathing animals and making uh, comparisons between the two. Uh, you also had mentioned you really like the idea of sharing thoughts about fighting, courtship, uh, all of those things, I love doing that. I love speculating on what prehistoric life, uh, how prehistoric life acted. And again, you've got to have some kind of basis in fact to do that, I think. And I suggest that you look around at modern animals and, and look at them as sort of the window to prehistoric life. Uh, Zach from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, my good buddy Zach. Uh, Zach wants to know my opinion of what I think would happen if people were thrown together with dinosaurs, sort of like the Jurassic Park scenario. Um, Wow, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, I, I, people ask me all the time, Zach, if, if I would like to see a dinosaur. My answer is always depends on which one and how close I am. <laughs> um, I would love to see that. Well, let's say that that happened. Let's say that, that uh, in the future somebody figures out a way to clone a dinosaur and then we bring them back to life. Um, there would be a lot of things. Number one, we couldn't really come in contact with them because we potentially carry diseases that we could spread to them that they have no immunity to, and perhaps vice versa. They may have something in them that could be very detrimental to mankind. So we would never be able to interact with them in, a, in, a, in an environment. Um, some of them, obviously, they would look at us as simply a food source. Um, the plant eaters would probably disregard us if they were really big, but the problem is when you're dealing with animals that have relatively small brains, and dinosaurs do, they are reactive, and therefore the slightest thing can cause them to react in a way that could be very detrimental to whoever happens to be nearby. So if we could bring them back, we would never get close, and if we did, unfortunately, Zach, I don't believe we would be around very long because they're just so massive and they have such an array of weaponry that uh, we wouldn't survive. Uh, Arthur from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Arthur, I've never been there. Uh, man, I'd love to go. He says, what is, this, what is the true size of Saurophaganax and the size of Giganotosaurus? Uh, Giganotosaurus, I think, is about 45 feet long, is, I think, a, a pretty good estimate of its size. Um, and no complete skeleton has ever been found, so that's sort of difficult. Saurophaganax, now that's something different. Saurophaganax is very, very rare. Not a lot is known. I have a Saurophaganax in my traveling dinosaur exhibit. Uh, he is a monster, uh, but he's not as big as they propose he gets. 
I've seen estimates that Sorophaganax may have been able to reach 48 feet in length, making him certainly one of the, if not the, biggest predatory dinosaur that ever lived. The problem with Sorophaganax is that uh, so few remains have been found that we just can't uh, say with any certainty how big he is. But again, the evidence that I've seen, and based on the skeleton that I have in my exhibit, uh, that skeleton does not appear to be an absolute full-grown mature adult. At least the the uh, bones don't don't suggest that it's a full grown adult, and he's big. Except mine is like 42 feet. He's a he's a big dude. So I would suggest that he's probably much bigger than we're thinking, but safely 45 to maybe 48 feet feet in length. He's a big guy. Uh, Dennis from Bridgeport, Pennsylvania. Dear Dinosaur George, I know T Rex can beat a Spinosaurus, but would T Rex beat Giganotosaurus? Um, I think it would. Even though Giganotosaurus appears to be longer and taller, he's a very distinctively different dinosaur than Tyrannosaurus rex. Think of Giganotosaurus as a, uh, as a sort of a medium weight fighter and think of Tyrannosaurus rex as a heavyweight fighter. The difference in their jaw design, the difference in their tooth design. Uh, if Giganotosaurus bit Tyrannosaurus rex, it would hurt like crazy. If Tyrannosaurus rex bit Giganotosaurus, he would crush him. That's sort of the difference. So I believe that the mass of Tyrannosaurus would outgun the weight, I mean the length and height of Giganotosaurus. And he also asked, uh, would Liplorodon be able to beat or eat Megalodon? Uh, again, this is another animal that these two didn't live together. But if they did, I think Megalodon would have an advantage, and it would be this. Megalodon doesn't have to surface to breathe, and therefore he never, never has to stop the fight and lower his guard to rush up to the surface to grab oxygen. Whereas Liplorodon can only fight for so long, and he's got to go up and get air. Well. If he's racing up to get air, he's completely and absolutely broken off any chance of defending himself, and therefore Megalodon would take advantage of that and rip the guy to shreds. Now, if Liplorodon got those gigantic jaws on him, he could certainly kill um, a uh, Meg. The other thing about Megalodon is having no bones, his body is much more flexible, and therefore, even though he's huge, he can maneuver a little more easily than that gigantic Liplorodon. Liplorodon has got to rely on those big flippers to get him where he's going, <clears throat> excuse me, Megalodon relies solely on that gigantic tail and he can pick up speed much quicker, he can take off faster because of the side to side movement of the tail. So I think he's got more advantage. Uh, let's see, Lewis from Chatham United Kingdom said, did Brachios uh, Brachiosaurus survive into the Cretaceous period? Uh, that's a tough one, Lewis, and I'll tell you why. There's a big gap missing in the fossil record from the end of the Jurassic and the beginning of the Cretaceous. There's a big gap missing there. So we don't know whether or not some of the dinosaurs survived into the Cretaceous. It's certainly plausible that Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Allosaurus, uh, Stegosaurus, some of those guys may have made it into the early Cretaceous. We just haven't found evidence of it yet. Um, Brachiosaurus was, was, was a pretty successful dinosaur. Uh, he's a big dude. I mean, we find him in Africa and we find him in North America, so he had a, had a wide range. Of course, at one time, Africa and, and uh, South and North America were all kind of combined, so he didn't swim or anything like that to Africa. but. Uh, certainly he had a wide range. Um, I would not be surprised if that were not the case, that Brachiosaurus may have made it at least somewhat into the early Cretaceous. But until we find a location that has that formation, uh, we really don't know. We just don't know what happened between the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. All right, that's it for this one. Uh, if you've got any questions you want to send me, go to dinosaurgeorge.com. While you're there, check out all of my website. For those of you that live in and around San Antonio, check out the dinosaur exhibit page. It's going to be a big event. Until then, I will talk to you guys later. For you little guys, practice your manners, practice your reading, and I will talk to you all again soon. I'll see you.